I can't see all the others. Some people will have turned no, off ah, their there, cameras. There you are. Yeah. So where are all the others? Because oh, I see if people... You believe it's good if not everybody has the video on because it slows down the system. So we only have the video on for the speakers, okay? Ah, okay, I understand. Yes. David, can you turn on the PowerPoints? Will you be managing those? Um, okay, I can. It's, it'll be a little bit strange because I can't. Uh, do what I'd normally do, but uh, here goes. I'll show Simon's screen first. Let's select. Okay, thank you David, uh, and welcome to everybody. I see that we have 16 people in this meeting. I should say that this is very much a pre-made meeting and a practice meeting. It is a webinar to, uh, about the Virtual Centers of Excellence, which all of you know is one of the main deliverables of our project Aparton. And uh, we have two external speakers and Hilda Lees who is uh, uh, working on our work package for this. And uh, this afternoon, we wanted to hold an internal discussion for two reasons. First of all, uh, because so many people have been asking for it. Secondly, Hilde Lies is uh, finalizing her first discuss discussion document, and this is a good timing for people to have input. The other reason why we do this practice webinar is because uh, we shall be repeating it in October for our external stakeholders and we thought it would be a good idea to do this one first for ourselves as it is such a very important topic. Uh, on the agenda we have uh, four presentations in total. I will kick off by uh, showing you the slides by Simon. Uh, which uh, explain how the Virtual Center of Excellence fits the overall setup of Aparzen. Then, then Hilde Lies will give us a brief overview of uh, different VTOE approaches and what she's uh, uh, planning to put into her document. Then we have a guest speaker, Daniel Plating, who is from VMustNet, which is an initiative if I understood it well, in the area of video. And uh, very welcome, Daniel. We look forward to hear from you. And we have, uh, after that, Bram van der Werf, who will tell us a bit more about Open Planets Foundation. Bram, you have the honor of being more or less our house speaker so far, because you were also in our last webinar. And uh, it is so very nice that you're uh, willing to perform again today. Let me now briefly take you through the slides of Simon who couldn't make it this afternoon, but who will otherwise be showing this slide in our next webinar. Uh, next slide, David. David? Yeah, thank you. Oh dear. Sorry, it'll come up in a moment. Ah, sorry, it's just to have multiple screens okay. up here. There we are. All right. Well, as most people in this call know, uh, our Parson project is a project uh, in the form of a network of excellence. It's funded by the EU in, uh, in the Seventh Framework program. Uh, we've been running for one and a half year now and have two and a half more years to go. 
and it's coordinated by the SDFC in the UK. Next slide. And we have more than 30 partners whose logo you see here. Next slide. by our partners. Next slide. The objectives of a partner are within a very broad scope. It is about different applications, different aspects of the problem of digital preservation, and it wants to inventorize many approaches and techniques that are around. Basically, a person aims uh, is a defragmentation of effort and should lead into a virtual center of excellence of, about which you'll hear all later in this webinar. Next slide. The approach of a person is best depicted along two different dimensions. Uh, first of all, there are four different topics covered within digital preservation. The first one is the trust issue, and most of the work packages have taken place in the first year of the project. In the second year, which is now, it's about sustainability, cost models, uh, economic ways to, to keep this going. The third, the third topic is usability of preserved content and the fourth one is access. And along the other axis of this scheme you see that we've split up the work packages into four different streams. The first stream is about integration and it runs through all the four topics. The second stream is about technical research. The third stream is about non-technical research, policy, standards, etc. And stream four is about sustainable uptake and dissemination of the outcomes of this project. Next slide. Here we summarize how the uh, aim of the Virtual Center of Excellence has been ex the essential element in it is to come to a common vision of the digital preservation landscape. Next slide.
Uh, I cannot, Barbara. David is back. David is back. Ah, David is back. Yeah, there we go. Welcome back, David. Sorry about that. Okay, did we? Yeah, okay. We, we're in the air again. Um, the reason why... Um, the reason why we're uh, well, why we're paying so much attention to the PCOE as a concept is uh, it's fairly new to work like this. But what it really tries to do is to ensure that teams from different countries and from different kind of organizations can work together better and uh, can raise our sort of our joint level of expertise in this domain. And, uh, the key to a successful VCOE, as this slide says, is the vision which is shared by all members, including the know-how and the know-why of digital preservation. And the know-how also depends a lot on knowing who to ask if you have a problem somewhere. So that could be, in essence, uh, what the VCOE tries to do. Next slide, David. Okay, uh, the key questions, and perhaps we can make a first start today in getting some of them answered. The key questions are about uh, who should benefit from this VCOE? How can, can we ensure the sustainability over a longer lifetime? What should be the scope of activities? And what should our relationship be to existing coalitions and networks? So many things are being done and have been done before, and what can we learn from that in general? And this is also an important reason why we've been inviting uh, external speakers to this webinar. Next slide, David. Okay, today we shall be covering the following presentations. We have a slight change in the program. Uh, Hilde Lies will kick off with uh, everything she has assembled so far for her work package on VCOEs. Arius Neiders could make it. He's involved in the elections that are taking place in the Netherlands today. Okay. So uh, he's somewhere else. He's uh, preserving our democracy, I hope. And uh, But we do have Daniel Patings here, and he'll be explaining to us what he thinks that a person can learn from the must net. And we welcome again Bram van der Weer uh, of the Open Planet Foundation. And after discussion, we shall have a summary by David uh, how a person can use all the good information that we hear in these presentations. Hildelies, perhaps I can hand over to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I shall shut my microphone now because that's better for the system. And David, I, I hope you can put up Hildenie's slides now. A bit um, out of focus, David. Yeah, this is a bit better. Well, OK, I'm going to talk to you about centers of competence and virtual centers of excellence. And um, uh, perhaps you can go to the first slide, uh, next slide. Yeah, they're a bit. Are they uh, vague for everyone? Yeah, they're not entirely... I guess as long as they're readable. Oh, now Karen has this problem. Karen, did you... Uh... It's yeah. fine, it's fine. It's just about the compression, don't worry. It's... Yeah, but Karen can't read them in full. That was the issue we had earlier while we were, um, while we were testing it. Uh, but Karen, I, I sent around my presentation as well. To the list. So, for can you all hear me? I hope. So, for those who can't uh, see, those who can't um, 
read it, I also send it round to the uh, a Parson All list. So then you can follow it there. Okay, so um, I have changed uh, my, my uh, presentation a little bit. Um, I will talk, uh, I will give a background and overview of centers in this digital library domain. I will give some characterizations, but what kept not coming into the agenda, and which is what is important, but of course, I also have a topic what a person can learn from impact center of competence, because the KB happens to be in almost all of the projects we are talking about here, and we were involved with some of these uh, centers of competence. Uh, mainly OPF and, of course, impact uh, that the KB uh, led itself. Um, so th those are the things I, I want to, uh, to discuss. Next slide, please, David. Okay, now the background of these centers of competence or virtual centers of excellence or even virtual centers of competence, as I've seen one named. There was the I-2010 vision, that was be before we had the vision of the digital agenda. So that was the vision of Commissioner Redding. Uh, uh, but it has all flown into the digital agenda and it will go into the new work program, Horizon 2020. Uh, in this vision, uh, there was um, a, an important role foreseen for centers of competence and virtual centers of excellence in European research infrastructures, um, and that still is. And in the digital library fields, there are six centers now uh, I have identified and the EC has identified, and a Parson was one of them. And they were all funded under uh, FP7 or um, OPF that came out of the FP6 Planets project. And uh, collaboration between all of these centers uh, very strongly by the European Commission. And there is a lot of benefit in the sharing of resources, offering services uh, in a uniform and transparent uh, way that these centers do. And if the centers manage to collaborate, there will be new opportunities, the EC has made it clear. So uh, I speak here rather on behalf of uh, building a network of centers uh, that uh, the EC has really started in a meeting we had in 2010 of all these centers there. Um, uh, rather than as one of the APARSEN members, I rather speak on behalf of all these centers and I really would like to see us work together uh, very well. But this is where we see uh, we have overlap. I'm currently re um, compiling a uh, report on this, um, on the current best practice. I think we could, could all benefit from that. Next slide, please. So why would we share information? I think we could all support each other in the building of a sustainable organization for sharing uh, expertise, tools and resources that come out of our project and uh, to indicate areas of potential collaboration, because you will see that all of these centers have um, often, well, at least one, but often two to three people uh, who work for them, uh, who run the, the center. Imagine the costs. I think in the long run, we must be able to, to share resources, uh, but that is, of course, of, of future um, use. But there's other areas of potential collaboration. And what do we share? At this moment, I think it would be interesting to share basic information, background, vision, mission, uh, etc. Uh, and um, also, how will the center stay alive? That's really our best practice. How did we get our business model? What is it? Uh, what revenues do we think we would get? What are, how do we see our customers? And facts and figures, if we wish to share them on how it's really doing. Of course, it's very important to indicate what are the success factors, what do we think are the success factors in our center and the challenges, and where do we share. Uh, after the meeting in Luxembourg in the end of 2010, um, I set up a blog, centersofcompetence.wordpress.com, uh, that you can go and have a look at. And most of the representatives of the other centers here um, 
uh, also um, uh, have been invited to contribute to this blog. So far we have not, I must say, done much about it, but this uh, webinar of uh, a Parson is really a good uh, incentive to start uh, compiling information uh, again. And I hope that uh, the full report will end up there if everyone agrees that I can share all that uh, information. Also what comes out of this meeting, of course. Next slide, please. So what centers are we talking about now? There's um, the uh, Open Planets Foundation. Uh, that The aim is to ensure the take-up of digital preservation practices and tools. And it comes from the Planets Project, but it also uh, brokers for other uh, digital preservation solutions. And they foster that digital preservation challenges are that meet a solution that's widely adopted. Well, Bram will talk about how planets, uh, the Open Planets Foundation was set up uh, and how it's, it sustains itself a bit more later. Then there's Presto Center, also focusing on digital preservation and digitization for order of events. Um, and that is uh, run by um, uh, the Institute for Beeld and Geluid, or from the Institute for Beeld and Geluid, uh, in the Netherlands. But unfortunately, the Marius Snijders, who runs this, uh, couldn't join us, but we'll hope to hear more from him later. But this actually, the, the first two are the ones that have some overlap with uh, a parson, I think. Then there's Impact Center of Competence and Digitization for the digitization of historical printed texts. Uh, I will come to speak of that a bit later. 3D Co-Form Virtual Competence Center for three-dimensional digitization uh, for uh, tools to design and capture 3D objects. Uh, they have already contributed to the um, to the report, and we hope that um, uh, David Arnold will uh, join us for the next uh, webinar on this subject. Then there's VMustNet. Uh, for the integration of digital collections and virtual environments in museums. And Daniel Plettings is here to talk of that. And of course, a person as a network of excellence um, uh, for bringing together all the expertise in the field. Next slide, please. Now, looking at the centers, while I'm compiling this um, this uh, report and talking to people. Uh, I can have already seen, and you will also see that, that <clears throat> actually all of them have chosen a uh, not-for-profit legal entity. Um, they are either a, um, what again is the CIC? It's a uh, common interest community, or so, community interest um, something. <laughs> uh, I think um, Daniel Platix will talk of that because his, um, institution has also chosen that. Um, they are either, or they are, for instance, a Dutch stichting, which is a very nice form to choose, or a foundation of some other sorts. Um, and um, uh, OPF is a, um, a company, not a profit. Well, I now forget the, the full titles. It's all in, um, in my reports uh, that I will publish later. So the income is mostly a mix of uh, membership fees, paid services, and funding for projects. Actually, ex most of people go for that. Some of them go for projects, really, with others. Then um, the organization is most often, well, always, really, a small core facility of one to three FTE, consisting of um, one person who, does, uh, who leads and is business developer, mostly. There's often a form of technical uh, coordinator or developer involved and an admin uh, person who uh, also does a, a lot of web um, presence, uh, communications, etc. There's always the website as the main hub and uh, some of them are very uh, active in social media, others aren't, but there's also always still uh, the good old fashioned website as the main hub for the center. And all of them uh, that, that we currently see do have strong buy-in from the original consortium. Next, please. Well, some very first observations on, on looking at all these centers. 
um, uh, well, what keeps them in the air, and um, well, what, what do we see? Opportunities for revenue seem to be very dependent on the field. It turns out that digitization uh, offers, for instance, more opportunities to earn money uh, than digital preservation, which is much harder for a center to, uh, to for instance, to attract uh, commercial partners. It seems that VMASnet has been very enterprising already as a project. Um, and I hope that uh, uh, Daniel will tell us more about that, because um, they have already been successfully initiating new projects and gaining revenues. It seems that Impact has been most active and successful engaging commercial partners in the center. OPF then has a very strong community in the digital preservation field and uh, was actually the first to get off the ground and is still going strong and especially this community has managed also to successfully involve the community of the SCAPE project, uh, another uh, research project in digital preservation. And then there's the CoForm uh, Virtual uh, Competence Center uh, that is still building its center like a, a Parson is. And it has a very strong emphasis on practical deployment of 3D documentation. And that should be very encouraging to membership. And I also noticed that these guys are very uh, proactive as well. Uh, they were at a, a big European do where all the ministers uh, of Europe were. And they were there with a little laptop. Uh, showing uh, what uh, 3D code form uh, could offer them. Next, please. Hi, Next come slide, up in please, moment. David. Okay, so now I would like to move to uh, impact. What a person uh, could. It's there. Yes. So what a person could learn from impact, um, first some basic information. Um, uh, the impact center of competence builds on the project improving access to text, to text that just finished in June of this year, 2012. It worked for four and a half years and brought together 26 partners, libraries, imaging scientists, industry partners, digitization professionals, all for building tools for digitization, mainly uh, for better language technology, better OCR, that sort of thing. Uh, we have chosen uh, for the moment the, the, uh, non, uh, the legal entity as a non-profit foundation of the hosting organization, which is the Biblioteca Virtual Biblioteca Cervantes in Madrid and Alicante. And we will have a later decision on a, for an independent entity. The offices are in Madrid. Uh, but actually the work is carried out mostly in Alicante, University of Alicante. Um, we have a board of members, premium members, so that means people who pay as a public organization 6,000 euros or a company 10,000 euros. Um, now still they become automatically part of the board of premium members, so actually you pay for having a big say. And we also have normal members uh, that are heard in more general uh, forms. But as a premium member, you're still automatically part of the board. And if we get more than 15 or something, we will uh, probably um, go from there to a choosing the board from the members. So that will not be too big. Uh, the management consists of a, um, a manager, a developer, uh, support, all in Alicante. Uh, and distributed effort of members um, in all kinds of things. Uh, the, the KB offers um, a, a technical um, advisor one day a week. Um, we offer support in business development. Uh, the the Poznan Supercomputing Center uh, uh, supports the website, uh, hosts it, supports the maintenance. Uh, software maintenance is done by all kinds of different partners, um, etc. So we really have a distributed effort. Next, please. So how do we, um, how did we get in the air and how do we stay alive? We have this combination of membership and we offer things for pay-as-you-go uh, services, for instance, consultation, uh, but also sponsorship offers for uh, commercial partners. The customers are three groups that, that, that really reinforce each other. Content holders, research institutes, and 
identifiers. And to give you one example where the different groups are interesting for each other is content holders and libraries who do big digitization programs. They are of great interest to um, service providers who provide integrated services and software. They want to reach that group of content holders, of course. So they are willing to join center, to pay for uh, a stand at a conference, uh, that sort of thing. We have membership fees, or I already um, talked about this. This should be 600 to 10,000. It's 600 for a library to become a member, or 1,000 for a, um, a small or a commercial uh, organization, and 6,000 for the premium membership to 10,000 for the uh, commercial partners. We currently have nine premium members. These are all the founding members, and we're in the process of reg re registering approximately 40 standard members. Now, Isabel from Alicante has joined us. Is this more or less the correct figure, the, the most up-to-date figure? Well, maybe she can update us later there. Or Lika can, she's also there. Well, anyway, I thought it was about 40 at the moment, but it's, of course, go. it's an ongoing process. Uh, so, next, please. So, how did we build our um, center of competence? We did this with the whole consortium, and we used this canvas for business model generation. I hope to come back to that in another session. I just wanted to briefly show you uh, this was the methodology. There's a link in the slide. You can look it up later. Please, the next. So we had a lot of sessions in the consortium. For two years, we got together in little different groups, always about 10 to 50 people, executives, developers, people from organizations. We invited people. And we did a lot of thinking together. Next, please. All 26 partners all throughout Europe were involved, as you can see. This was the spread. This is also the start. This is the basis of the center. It's always, I could tell you, that your current consortium in a, in a project is the basis of your, uh, your follow-up. Uh, and, and you should be very... Um, you should cherish, cherish these people. Next, please. So why did we have all these sessions? It was, on the one hand, to gather ideas, and a lot of good ideas came from it. But most important was finding the commitment, because if you involve people in it, they become committed. And uh, it, it has worked wonderfully for, for impact. And I, I think it works everywhere. If you in, involve people in building it, they will be more committed than if you just propose something to them and they just lean back enough to think about it. It's, it's not theirs. They, they don't own it. So in impact, that works really wonders. Next, please. Yeah, well, this is what came out of the canvas. Uh, we identified those three big target groups that, that would mutually or, or all three benefit from each, other's, from each other. And we defined all these nine building blocks for this center of, uh, uh, for our center of competence. And this is the, the, the canvas that came out of all these sessions. And it, this is the one for content holders. But we also had one for researchers. And we also had one for service providers. And this, these canvases are really uh, good for still selling the value of the, the center. You can always go back to it and use it in your marketing and business development. Uh, it has really been very beneficial, as much as it has been fun. Next, please. So success factors. Strong home base we had. I already told you. Um, the partners had a good network. And um, they tapped into it to extend it. We have a distributed organization, a shared costs, a sound business model, and a lot of encouragement from the EC. Uh, our project was extended to support the building of, its, of the center not, with hardly any effort. Yeah, really uh, good support of EC. Next, please.
and in sustaining it, I think uh, our success factors currently are the users are really keen to test and use the tools and resources provided. Uh, the interoperability platform uh, Impact developed allows showcases and testings of tools. Uh, there's considerable interest of private sector companies. Uh, we have managed to obtain project funding for activities that support the aims of the center. It's a project currently still uh, actually at this moment or tomorrow it's, in no, uh, it's being negotiated at the EC. It's a succeed project. Um, we keep the costs low and we have ongoing enthusiasm and commitment of partners. Next please. Challenge are, well, we think challenges are responding to the expectations of our potential and current members. It's always a big challenge for all these centers. Integrating tools and services in the website, well, that's always harder than you think. Supporting the implementation of tools in organizations, we will have to always find the experts for that. Keeping innovation alive in the long term and to continue to identify and attract target customers and stakeholders. These are our biggest challenges at the moment, I would say. So this is where you find more information. Next, please. Some ideas for a person. Define the role in the field, I would say, and define a sustainable business model. Next, please. This is an idea that the KB has of how the APARSEN VCOE could be embedded in the field of digital preservation. And this uh, could probably come up later in the discussion when David summarizes and sees how we can use this for APARSEN or maybe in the questions session later. Next, please. Yeah, for building the business model, I would I would uh, suggest that you use um, this business model generation uh, methodology that we, that we used, and um, we could at some point, maybe in the next one or in a physical meeting, have a session uh, uh, on filling these uh, building blocks. I think that was it. Um, my presentation. Um, thank you. Yeah. I think that, that was the last one, right? Yes, thank you. I get back thank to you, a Hilda Lee. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hilda Lee. This was uh, very, very interesting. And um, uh, I learned a lot. Uh, before we uh, go on uh, with the presentation of Daniel, uh, let me give a short opportunity to the people in this meeting. Does anybody have immediate questions for clarification? So not to start the discussion, but more things weren't clear. C could I ask? C could Anyone? I ask something? No one. I, oh, hold on. Then I'm could happy I ask to a hand question? over to Daniel. Thanks for Eve coming. Um, I've just got sorry. one question, and that is, um, uh, and I. Uh, uh, yes, it's it's David, a question, right? I guess, for all of the um, uh, presenters, and that is, it's a question for all of the presenters, I, I think, and that is, what wasn't clear to me. I cannot hear you, me. Um, let me type. Yes. So, in other words, was was the field completely um, clear?
clear and this was a new uh, yes I, I see I, I understand your question David uh, yeah this is very interesting yes can, can I answer Evke Yes, please, Hilda. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, um, for impact, uh, there was actually uh, none. There were all kinds of organizations who provided information and, and uh, uh, digitization courses, but there was no uh, organization that was a sort of hub for all the tools and, and also new uh, research, which is uh, quite unique for impact. But I recognize your question. Uh, because in, uh, we have now submitted a uh, proposal that is going to be funded and there we build up on our center of competence um, something uh, with other people as well. And uh, so there is an existing uh, organization, namely the Impact Center of Competence for Digitization, and there is this new project. And we assume that uh, the outcome of that new project will be broader than our center of competence. So then we will, uh, uh, we will um, run into that challenge as well, how to, to reconcile uh, uh, the two. Uh, but um, uh, there were also other organizations uh, like um, Clarin, which is a network or a research infrastructure for sharing tools as well. But it was not very mature. It, 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 it didn't have the same... Um, uh, task. Uh, so impact came from relatively a new position. But I'm, I'm really interested in this uh, question. It's a good question and, and I hope that the others will also answer um, at the end or during their presentation. Thank you, Hilde Lies. Then my suggestion is we uh, continue with Daniel. Uh, Daniel, please go ahead. The floor is okay. Good. Here we go. So my name is uh, Daniel Plittings. I am the coordinator for dissemination and exploitation in the vmust.net network of excellence. And vmust stands for Virtual Museum Transnational Network. Next slide, please. <coughs> so what is vmust trying to do? Uh, VMUST is trying to tackle the problem that we use digital technologies today in museums, in cultural heritage, and that most of these things are not stable. So we try, in fact, to improve that and implement the museum of the 21st century. And in such a museum, we see an active role of the visitor, not passively looking at things which are exhibited, but actively working exploring, interrogating things in a museum. And of course, a museum is something that has a long tradition. I think in Europe we have an enormous body of knowledge and tradition on how to deal with culture, and especially museums. We don't have to throw that away. So we have to make current uh, traditions, of, uh, current museums of today transit into these new functions. We need to help them in what they now do in preserving our cultural heritage, in study our cultural heritage and share it with their visitors. We have to help them in improving that activities uh, to that new 21st century functions. And finally, at the end of the, of, of the day, at the bottom of all these things is to create jobs. Why is the European Commission funding us? Basically because they hope, in fact, we can stimulate in one way or another our research and our economy. And so uh, if there is one part that we still can grow in that is in our cultural uh, knowledge and exploiting that cultural knowledge on a European, but definitely also on a worldwide scale, so and create uh, jobs and more and more virtual museums and digital museums are seen as a part of creative industries. So what do we try to realize as an impact? We try to make systems much more robust, much more cost-effective, 
much more fitting with fitness for use. And fitness for use also means that we need to reach a wider audience. Definitely we need to reach def the, the younger audience in using technologies such as games, uh, serious games for example, uh, that can appeal to them and that can uh, uh, catch their attention uh, in museums. On the other hand, uh, we need more and more to see in the museum and in the cultural heritage sector these things as investments. That means also that and if we invest in certain technologies, in certain digitization, in certain uh, public presentations, we also need to make sure that it has a longer life cycle. Right? That it really is something that is not dead after three, four years, but that can be maintained, that can be uh, transited to new computers, to new platforms, and can have a long, longer life cycle. At this moment, we kind of queue or we kind of uh, put forward as a target 15 years to have uh, as a life cycle of uh, uh, products of digital installations and digital virtual museums of the internet that we make. And which is pretty long if you look at the uh, current um, practice, in fact, most of these virtual museums today not have a longer uh, lifetime than three, four years. On the other hand, if we uh, make something a much more uh, longer life cycle, we also can talk about portability. Can I have an installation, an, an exhibition in my museum also installed in your museum as a temporary exhibition? Can I reuse part of it in other exhibitions? Or can I reuse assets of it in other exhibitions? Or can I exchange between museums? And so on. So these kind of questions are really very important in what we're trying to do. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so what is the competence center then trying to do? So we, of course, uh, have to continue our network of excellence, knowledge uh, and competence uh, as an organization. So that means after the project stops, and that is only within two and a half years from now, we need to be able to continue our uh, service and our functionality as a network of excellence. So we need to continue to support the community, which consists of museums, cultural heritage, and research institutes working in this field, in the field of digital uh, heritage, let's say, and in how uh, such heritage can be uh, put to value to uh, the community. This uh, we need to continue. But what is, of course, the uh, problem there? The problem is that not only we need to formalize the knowledge that we have within the group, but also keep that knowledge up to date. We need to make sure that everybody uh, which is using a certain technology uh, can still use an updated version of that technology in the future. Huh? We also need to do it in such a way that this is sustainable. So that means, in fact, that um, we need financing, we need a way to finance ourselves on a long-term basis. We need to reach at least all of Europe, and hopefully wider, huh? uh, which is, of course, organization-wise, not an easy task. And we need to do that really on a European day-by-day -day, uh, scale. Next slide, please. <clears throat> yes, it's coming. Yep. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so how do we want to achieve that? So first of all, uh, we have a lot of knowledge on improving um, digital heritage and use at their use in museums and in cultural heritage. But you can talk about that, you can show, you can consult, but we are from the idea that you also can simply do it and do it in terms of realizing, implementing projects. And so we try to realize this knowledge transfer by doing the project, by implementing, in fact, what the knowledge is about. So that means, in fact, we're trying to do the whole range of projects that you have when you come up with an idea in a museum that you first have to conceive the idea, you have to consult about the idea, you have to do an impact study, you need to find the right funding for it, 
you need to implement it, you need to realize it, but also after that and it's all running well, the public comes and sees it, you also have to maintain it, that it works day by day, and you also have to assess if it is working properly and if you still can improve your uh, implementation. The way we want to do that is very similar to what we already have heard before, is a non-profit organization that has a kind of coordination role with very limited staff, we think of three to four people, and uh, most of those people are working in a kind of coordination role, but also in a legal role. You will see immediately why, because we work with a lot of subcontractors. Yeah? Um, what is the structure? We think that we will have a membership for all parties, and so it's just free and you can join it. No, we will have a, a membership, a membership which is very decent, huh? which is probably only a few hundred euros per year. The concept, as I just said, is that we are a service broker. That means that we have a certain project that uh, is coming to us and we uh, divide the project up in different parts and we subcontract those different parts to specialists. Those specialists are members of the competence center and they are members because they have been selected for their expertise, for their way of uh, negotiating their skills in the sector, or also their location. Yes? Some of the services that we want to provide are lo location-based. Yeah? You need to be close to your customer. Most of the services we want to provide are independent of the location. It can be done anywhere. But nevertheless, you need presence. You need to know your organization. You need to know the structure. You need to know the language. You need to know the, law, the laws. You need to know the customs and so on. So that is all important in having also some local um, um, foot on the ground also. So how do you want to implement that is in fact through an international non-profit association, uh, which is one of the non-profit forms that already has been mentioned. And uh, there will be founding members which come from the current consortium. And there will be a large number of associated members, which we already have. We already have at this moment more than 50 associated members to the network and that number is growing every day and from those associated members of the current network of excellence we will do a selection procedure so we will select um, partners of our competence center for a, a duration of for example three years and after three years you need to be reselected so how is this managed this is managed by a board of directors huh? and uh, with the General Assembly, General Assembly with representatives from the founding members and from the associated members. Of course, in what we are doing and how we're doing it, we want advice. So we, at this moment in VMAST, we already have a museum advisory board and an experts advisory board. Experts is about more the technology. Huh? And so we will continue those two bodies on giving us advice on uh, general uh, approach on, on, on general uh, way we do things like that. They will be elected, regularly uh, elected uh, as we do today. Next to that, we also will have networks of museums and cultural heritage organizations which are basically the customers. So we want, in fact, everybody who has a project realized in the competence center to become kind of part of the club and help us defining are we really doing the right thing? Because we work for let's say a museum as a customer, so it is always good of museum, having museums in the group that help us in checking if we're really doing the right thing. On the other hand, most of the implementation force of this uh, network of excellence, will, uh, of this competence center better, will be a network of companies, will be companies that have implementation capacity and they also will have their own network in, for example, making uh, new corporations and so on. Next slide, please. So the practical implementation, as I said, the competence center will see as a service broker. That means, in fact, that a project, in fact, is divided up in different parts and all of the uh, different parts are seen as services. There is no, no products involved. Right? So that means, in fact, 
that digitization, writing software, implementing, installing, whatever, it's all provided as services. And for those services, we look for the best party, best party in terms of excellence, in terms of cost, in terms of practical implementation, for example, being local, uh, speaking the, the language of the, of the customer, and so on. The core of such an implementation are project coordinators. This is really the Achilles heel to do these things. And we will train a large pool of project coordinators that can uh, help a project go through these different stages from beginning to end, from conception to over implementation to maintenance. And we will train these uh, project coordinators that will be the major way of investing, in fact, in our knowledge and keeping our knowledge up to date really is within these uh, project coordinators. The project coordinator decides how, in fact, the project is uh, divided in different pieces and how the subcontracting is done to the different partners. Huh? So the, from different uh, parts of the project, and like I said, consulting, for what we call first-line consulting, which is orienting your project. I have, I'm a museum, I have a certain idea, but I don't know how to implement that. Well, you need first the kind of orientation stage where you say, okay, fine, use this kind of technology. Uh, that will be the best way of dealing with the kind of uh, audience that you have, and so on. And so on. Impact studies uh, can also help in that. And then we come to a stage that there is definition of what exactly to do. Then you can go, for example, for public tendering. And that public tendering needs tendering documents, which the competence center can make, or it can help in fundraising. And for example, it's very important to have a good group of different people that can help in this aspect of fundraising. Um, we need them to create the consortium, create the different uh, experts that will realize the project, huh? or that will uh, come up with the project proposals, will execute the project, and then will also maintain the project and put results from the project in a common repository. Okay, this is all done by subcontracting, so there is a, quite an important legal part with contracts that is done, and that means also that if there are within the group partners that can compete with each other for a certain job, then there will be an internal demand for office simply done. Huh? So this is quite very business uh, uh, oriented uh, in this one. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Can I have the next slide, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, so as I said, project coordinators are a very important key element of that. They need to be independent, or they can be an employee at uh, uh, partners of the competence center, but they need to be geographically spread all over Europe. Because if you do a project in Greece, you want a Greek to uh, do the project coordination, not only speaking the language, knowing the country, knowing the languages, knowing the customs, uh, knowing uh, the laws, and so on. Of course, we will select these people for their excellent for their competences uh, through a selection procedure and train them. The way we implement that is in fact uh, a two-track implementation because we need for, on one hand local uh, presence and on the other hand we need also central services. Locally we also want to do not only a realizing projects, implementing projects, but also doing seminars, training events, uh, network activities, um, Make sure that we know what is going on locally so that I can update the knowledge base from local activity. If there is a successful project somewhere, we want to know that. If it is successful technology used somewhere, we want to have that in our knowledge base. And of course, uh, if we train, we want to do that also in the local language. So we want to localize a lot of the resources that we have. The resources are texts, uh, videos, uh, training sessions, and so on. On the other hand, of course, we need to have central activities like marketing, uh, evangelization. And, uh, it's not so obvious that we use digital technologies in museums. There's still a lot of resistance, nevertheless, there is a lot of interest. So we need people to convince that the approach that we have and the, the way uh, we deal with uh, uh, all the different issues which are there is a good way 
and that we also can show them success stories uh, that help uh, convincing people on adopting the technology that we have laid out. And of course, we need to deal with uh, all things like membership and so on. Next slide, please. No. Can I have the next slide, please? Or is this the last one? No? no. Okay. Yes, yes, okay. Um, so, as I said, there is a selection procedure. So that means not everybody can become member of this competence center. And member becomes, in fact, most of the people that uh, realize that uh, project. Uh, those who are the customers, in fact, can be also a member once their project is, in fact, finished. Huh? So a competence center member, first of all, we want them to be part of our group now, huh? of, the, of the network of excellence as an associated member, and then they can kind of be promoted to a competence center member. Huh? And how do we select them? Well, we select them, in fact, on three different criteria. We select them on commitment, competence, and capacity. Commitment means that they need to be committed to use digital technologies in the cultural heritage sector. And it is not so trivial as it sounds, because, in fact, you can be a web developer, for example, and say, OK, once in a while I do some uh, stuff for the cultural heritage sector. You need to know the sector. You need to know what the needs of the sector are. And that means that you not only have to invest in uh, people that have knowledge about that sector, but you also need to invest in the right tools, in the right software, in the right training for your people, sometimes in the right uh, equipment to really be able to deal with issues in the cultural heritage sector. Of course, you need to have competence that is uh, clear in itself, but you also need to have capacity. That means that you need to be able to do a certain job within time and within budget. And so that means that if you're a small company and you have a big project, we rather would go for a bigger company that really has the capacity to do this in time than for a small company that would be drowned in a, too much work. Huh? Uh, finally, the uh, decision on who is selected and not goes to the board of directors. And there is a clear, transparent uh, tr um, selection procedure that uh, goes with independent people, but it's finally the board of directors who have the last say on doing this. And on the other hand, uh, one of the things that we don't want to do is grow too fast. We want to have a very natural growth in this, because it is a growing market. At this moment, we're really in a, a, a point that there is a lot of interest in using digital technologies. So we want to keep the best opportunities and take these opportunities so that we have a natural growth of our competence center and not something really explosive or really uh, too forced out. Huh? And of course, if you're a member of the competence center, uh, then uh, renewal of that membership also will be done each two or three years and also with a certain uh, procedure. Next slide, please. So business model, where do we get the money uh, to run all this? Well, of course, on the project budget will be an overhead fee, which goes to the central organization. And that central organization is, as I said, only a few people uh, big. Huh? Um, most of that income we see coming from the project itself. On the other hand, we will see some fees coming from training that will not be for free. No? And some fees also from the digital repository that we're setting up and that we try to reuse uh, the digital assets. And so in this way, part of the cost for reusing digital assets will be a fee that goes to the competence center. We hope to make profit in this. And so we want to in reinvest our profit in the operational structure. So that means practically that we want to train partners, mainly our project coordinators, and most of our uh, profit will be reinvested in our project coordinators in the knowledge that's really the beating heart of the project. On the other hand, of course, we have a knowledge base that needs to be um, uh, kept up to date, huh? and that will also need part of the budget. and. Um, also, we need to keep the team together. We need to make sure that we have, are sticking together as a good team that knows each other and 
works with each other, so we need also to do some team building. Why, why would um, people select, in fact, the VMAS Competence Center instead of some big company doing their job for them? Well, we have some added value, we think. Uh, on one hand, we can provide them really experts on the European level. So the, the word we're going for is, in fact, quality. We want to deliver quality. If, we don't, or if we're not able to deliver something with quality, we won't do it. Right? Second thing is we really focus on the museum and the cultural heritage domain. So we really want to have good solutions that last long and that in this way are uh, uh, fitness, have a good fitness for use. Huh? We also provide a one-stop total solution. That means that the museum can come to us, we divide the, the work and we, we look for the right partners, we look for the right experts, we, we guide, in fact, a museum through the whole process from conception to maintenance, so that's a one-stop solution, which I think is very, very important. And finally, what we offer also is that we, what we deliver is really um, uh, guaranteed to have a long life cycle. So that means, in fact, if you do a certain project today, that, will, that project will not die in the coming three, four years. That will last for many more years and is, in this way, a good investment. So to conclude my uh, 10 slides here, uh, will uh, have this legal entity still created by, by the end of the year, huh? this uh, international non-profit association. We have uh, a lot of internal projects already uh, being defined. We had a meeting yesterday where the test projects were decided, and this test project will now start. We also have an exhibition that we do, a major large exhibition in four places uh, in Europe in 2014, which are also internal projects. And these projects will be used, in fact, to test this whole procedure, to test the whole structure, and also to create, in fact, our design guidelines on how we did make such projects and how we create this uh, guarantee for a better life cycle and for a better uh, quality. We will start doing external projects 2013. We already have several projects in the pipe, uh, but they have not started yet, so we didn't have income yet but that is already planned and we hope also by 2013 to have projects, external projects running. Which means in fact that we will be operational doing external projects for two years within the project. And so in this way really be up and running before the project closes. Same for the repository, we already have material now ready to go in the repository and in 2013 we will have an operational repository of digital museum objects. So, that was it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. This is uh, very impressive what we're doing there. Um, and I see an immediate question popping up from David, and that is, who funds the project solution? Could you answer that question? Yes, definitely. As I explained, in fact, uh, suppose that the museum comes to us and says, okay, we want to uh, have a collection that we have here in our museum digitized and digitally restored, right? So what we do then, in fact, is do the study. We do the different stages of that. We look for the right partners of that. And we calculate the cost of the whole project in the different stages. And on top of that cost, which will be paid, in fact, to our partners that do the work, which we subcontract, we, of course, will have a certain extra uh, overhead fee on top of that. How, that mu how much that is exactly uh, is uh, something we need now to decide in the coming months, because we are working on our business plan, but that will be uh, very soon decided, and so there will be a certain percentage on top of that that will uh, provide the income for the Competence Centre, which is a non-profit organisation, and yes, only having three, Thank four you. people maximum on the payroll. Is that answering your questions? Dave, I think it does. Can I also ask something? Um, Daniel, can I... Um, I found it very interesting. Uh, I'm really glad you shared this. Uh, and I, do, I just want to ask you, can I share this um, uh, further? Yes, you <laughs> your, your presentation. 
because the whole definition what I, I am I'm, uh, talking here about, in fact, is a short version of the text which is publicly available on our website. If you look for Competence Center on our VMAST website, you will find a large ah. document which explains all this in detail. The next of version of, of this document, which is our business plan, will not be public. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the current definition, what I explained now, is public material. So that's, uh, that's uh, you can share that, no problem. Good, thanks. That's just what I, yeah, it's very uh, inspiring. And I'm looking forward to, um, to talking further uh, with you. Well, we have opportunity, I just have to mention that, that we had within the uh, EPOC project, uh, which was running from 2004 to 2008, we already had the intention to make such a center. And we have spent four years on discussing all this and thinking uh, about it, to, to talking with a lot of partners, a lot of companies, a lot of uh, research centers, and so on. We had hundreds of people uh, giving us input on this. And in fact, all the ideas that I now come forward with are the result of that process. We have then put in a proposal for funding, which was not awarded at that moment. And now we have uh, put this proposal, in fact, in the VMAS project. So now it's, this is the context in which we implement this finally. Eh? So. Ah. Yeah, great. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to hand over to Bram now. We had Bram also in our last meeting. And um, my question to you, Bram, is because I want to keep time for the general discussion. Do you think you can do this in perhaps more 10 minutes than 15 minutes? But I don't want to speed you up okay. unnecessarily. No, it should be okay. Please go ahead. Okay. Well, actually, I'd like to start with, uh, with the concluding slide of, uh, uh, of Daniel, uh, I think, and that's the part on the legal entity. I think OPF is already a legal entity. We are now uh, already there, up and running for a little more than two years. Um, and what I will that that was actually I will not uh, explain all the details of OPF. I think that's the thing what I did during the last webinar. Uh, what I'll walk you through is more or less the types of lessons learned. That's the thing what Hillary also asked the lessons learned. So what we experienced over the last two years uh, when. Uh, setting up the Open Planners Foundation uh, and when building a community and when thinking about how to connect the community and what our place is. I think the legal entity itself, that, 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 that's a straightforward thing. We are a foundation, a foundation based in UK in Boston Spa. Uh, in the first period we of course did uh, standard things, so we, uh, we walked over mission, vision, business plan, etc. Uh, what I can, uh, what I will definitely can share with you is that the business plan. I think we uh, ran through several uh, meetings with the board. So our uh, our uh, foundation is actually uh, governed by a board of directors, uh, and the board of directors consists of uh, uh, of people that are elected from our charter members. Actually, uh, in, in in our statutes, you can also. Uh, be uh, we can also have different people uh, in the board too. But at the moment. Uh, I think that will continue. Well, most directors are from our charter members. Uh, I think that the, the, the main thing what uh, what we learned over the period is that in the beginning we had a kind of optimistic plan on uh, how we could uh, grow the community based on the momentum of planets, uh, and then based on what we thought would be uh, a a kind of uh, marketing strategy and extend the community. I think uh, what we learned over the last two years is that you have to adjust uh, by what's happening in reality as well. I think uh, you can have uh, fantastic parts, and whether it's about potential services, uh, whether it's about potential growth, etc. To a certain extent, to uh, adjust over time as well, adjust business plans, uh, adjust based on the expected reality. Now, first, going back to uh, to to, uh, to uh, centers of competences. And the competence centers. It's a discussion. It's already like like Hildy was saying. Uh, we had a meeting in in Luxembourg. I think that's more than two years ago. Uh, I, I think that's the that's the part. It it was actually in the beginning when when I first started realizing that uh, uh, that that also the the, the, the idea uh, of uh, open plans would be position itself as a center of competence. I think that the uh, original 
uh, foundation of OPF was to kind of take up and build on the outcome of planets. But I think that the idea of a competence center is probably far more as well. And, and I think that that's also what we more or less uh, took, uh, to, 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 took to heart. And uh, I think one of the things what we actually said in that, uh, and, and, and also what we took is what part of competences is, is actually the part where OPF wants to be in. Because if you take a look at Planets itself, Planets was a huge project. And if you uh, sort of want to sustain the total outcome of Planets, uh, then uh, and, and think that you can uh, almost sustain all the all the software prototypes that have been produced over there, uh, then that will be an incredible challenge. I think what uh, and, and looking at uh, looking at some of the uh, other slides, uh, I think there were people and also in uh, in, in planets there was lots of uh, publications on policy, publications on curation, etc. The main focus and, and the main area where Open Planets Foundation is actually, uh, actually focusing on is on the practice and how can we bridge the gap of, uh, of, of research and make some of the outcome at least be implemented and deployed into organizations. What's, I think, a huge challenge. So actually that, uh, that meant that also in, in, in the, 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 the tools that we use, and then I mean more the mechanisms that we use, uh, we did not uh, really uh, focus ourselves on the policy components, preservation policy. We follow preservation policy. We uh, expect other uh, organizations that are in the space, whether it's DPC, whether it's NCD, more in the policy direction. Uh, but we will actually work on the outcome of projects uh, and see if we can stabilize them, make, them de uh, make some of the outcome deployable. Uh, I think the analysis that we did on the planet's outcome is that it was actually from the technology. A very limited amount was deployable. I'm quite more optimistic on the, uh, on the outcome of some of the technical components and tools from SCAPE because we have an earlier involvement and we can uh, uh, earlier involve ourselves in making some of these tools actually uh, more stable, better documented, uh, etc. So, but uh, again, uh, looking back to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the mechanisms and the tools that we use, uh, we have a very active uh, blogging site. Uh, we have a very, very, actually, uh, everyday growing wiki. And the wiki has also been fed a lot by, by outcome from SCAPE, but also by outcome from Spruce, uh, a UK funded project by JISC, uh, and by uh, uh, other potential uh, projects that, that we actually say, well, we can facilitate some of uh, of the, the the wiki functionality that you want to have, as long as it's in line with uh, with the functionality or with the focus that OPF actually has. But again, like we uh, what we try is uh, is help orphans uh, and uh, to to become more mature, and also help organisations via hackathons, uh, and also uh, next month we will start on training on real topics that are. Uh, that are, need to be addressed, whether it's uh, uh, helping uh, practitioners work with command line tools so that they have a better understanding of what's happening in, inside the repository or other things. I think we will, uh, we are acted at this moment consulting our members uh, via our surveys. Uh, what are the topics that they want to have in hackathons, that they want to have in the webinars? Uh, and these are the things that we actually uh, like to do. And, uh, and I think. The, the challenge, I think, the challenge, uh, if you are focused on, and that's that's a thing what we need to address in the coming period, if you are more or less focused on that technology niche, what, what we actually are, uh, and we still have to connect to the practitioner niche, uh, is that we need to, uh, and that's probably one of the biggest lessons learned over the last period, that even though we are in that niche, we still have to focus on getting buy-in from management as well. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, management is the part that uh, that that is your funding mechanism. You know, they pay the membership fee uh, because we are, for a big part, financed by membership fees uh, with our charter members uh, and with our affiliate members. Uh, the other important component for our uh, our community, and in particular with hackathons, uh, but also with webinars, is that uh, if we run them, we depend very, very much on the in-kind contribution of our members. Uh, I think uh, because the, 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 the community idea itself is that OPF is a 
facilitate in between our, uh, our members that knew each other very well from planets, that continue to work with each other in scape, uh, but the knowledge is within their organization. And uh, OPF is a kind of mechanism uh, via the site, via the wiki, via the hackathons, via the webinars, uh, to uh, distribute that knowledge to the wider community so we can enrich not only one specific uh, organization, but we can spread it out to more. That's also why, uh, actually, on a normal operation with sharing knowledge, we're also actually quite open. Uh, the, the, and that's sometimes a bit difficult to explain. Uh, but we are actually, our, our wiki and, and also our site, we have contributions, but also from organizations like the, 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 National, uh, the, the, the National Library of New Zealand and others. I, I think, but the, the, the main thing, and the main thing what I still say is that, uh, that, that to run the organization, you still need to have a, a decent funding. The other part where we have been uh, struggling with uh, over the period is how to involve ourselves in projects. I think projects are are in itself uh, maybe uh, always look like an alternative or an attractive way of. I think projects are actually, to a certain extent, also the the uh, some of the challenges that we have are actually result of projects as well. So the, why do we have so many orphan tools? Uh, because as soon as the project stops, they orphan the tools. They don't continue to support it anymore. And I think that's that's the part uh, what we hope to address by still staying involved in uh, in projects, but we don't want to have a, a major part of our funding depending on projects. I think uh, we still have a strong target and a strong focus uh, to have a major part of, of, of our fund uh, and, and our income uh, via our membership model. And uh, we will uh, every time try to look into our membership more whether we need to adapt to the new situation. I think economy is changing, uh, the, the the ecosystem itself is changing. Uh, and other alternatives, what we can also consider to uh, for income is sponsorship. Uh, some of the work we're doing at this moment, like we're doing some uh, market research uh, into the uh, long-term usage of legacy software, is sponsored by Microsoft Research. Uh, uh, other things like uh, we are looking into uh, uh, seeing uh, how to improve the practice around uh, preservation. There is there is some sponsoring potential as well, uh, but uh, the, 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 the potential sponsoring, let's say, in, in the practice uh, is actually quite uh, I think it was uh, expectation that there would be um, a, a huge enthusiastic take-up of commercial companies uh, that potentially would uh, provide service to sponsoring. I also think that the amount of uh, organizations in, uh, in digital libraries is actually quite limited as well. Uh, and so the bigger uh, multinationals and what do you call them, the, the oracles, the HPs and the IBMs are not directly interested. I think there are probably the the Tesselas and uh, and ex Libris's and maybe indirectly the OCLCs that ha that that are some stakeholders in this space, uh, but I think that's that's more or less what it is. So actually, what we did over the period is we created our community, and what we have is what you is sort of modeled uh, uh, like uh, open source organizations. It's a community of merit, uh, and uh, we uh, heavily depend. Uh, on uh, on in-kind contribution by members. I think that's actually the core where we are floating on. And that's actually, if you look to our, and your, our wiki uh, or our site, you see that most of the contributions are there from our members. And that's that's more or less the heart and also the sustainability of our, our organization. Any questions? Thank you very much, uh, This is here. Uh, any questions? The floor is open. None? Then I have a question actually for all speakers combined and perhaps uh, I can uh, uh, kick off the discussion in that way uh, also a bit. If I listen to the different
just well listening to different talks I was trying to define what the critical success factors are for a successful VCOE and uh, in all your talks I picked up three common elements that seem to play a role and I'd like you to comment on it and perhaps you have other ones or different ones uh, first a knowledge base and then you need to have a knowledge base and the, and the demand for a knowledge base and the knowledge can exist in people so you have experts or it can exist in projects that you do a second one committed partners to people who really want to create a community and do things together and see the merit of that again that uh, comes down to participation of people but also fees people wanting to uh, uh, pay membership fees for that and the third one is a broader one and that is the funding model so you need somewhere where you have income that can either be the membership fees that were mentioned or project funding or paid for services or whatever um, can I invite each of you to comment on these elements perhaps we can do it in the same order as uh, you've been speaking so that is Hilde Lies then Daniel then Bram okay yeah I think um I identified having a good business model and revenues already and also um, the commitment of partners. I already identified that myself as a sort of common thing, but I find it very interesting that you identify as a separate thing the knowledge that is in all these people. It is true and it is not only the knowledge but also the, um, um, the fact that they have built up something already together and it is um, a matter of sharing that with others and getting others in in that network as well. But I think it is an important uh, asset that you have that expertise in some form. You can't start it from scratch, from not having done something before. And I might also add that I found very interesting what Daniel said. Um, that was one that I had not identified. I had already seen that VMASnet was very successful in these uh, projects, um, but um, uh, he says that the best thing to, uh, to, to expand your network and to, to get people to learn new things as well is to do it with them. And I think that's a very interesting one, because that is our experience here in the library, for instance, as well, that this is a, a very good thing to, to get people in. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Daniel, you have anything? Okay. Can you hear me? Have some noise. I wonder where it's coming from. Okay. Um, yes, I think uh, this is you. Be did a very good analysis in uh, the sense that, um, as it also was saying, the, the knowledge base, in my opinion, is very, very crucial. It is something that uh, within technology is also changing rapidly. Huh? Uh, take, for example, what we do. We do 3D in museums, for example. We do natural interfaces. Today we use a Kinect. Guess what we use tomorrow? So this kind of knowledge is not only knowledge but also how do you implement it practically what does really work in practice what is stable and so on all this kind of knowledge is um, rapidly changed i think this is really one of the hard things for a competence center to to keep updated and to my opinion that's also the reason why we have chosen for project because the project forces you to always be updated up to date on this. Huh? You cannot deliver something that was okay five years ago, but which is not uh, okay anymore. Huh? So, um, on the other hand, um, having committed partners, I think um, it always needs to be a win-win situation. And I think 
that is also, to my opinion, what you need to try to find is win-win situations. And uh, is a museum is coming, to, and also the question that arises from that, who are our biggest competitors if we do such, such a thing, right? Are we competing against somebody or not? Huh? Um, but on the other hand, uh, creating such a win-win situation means that, in fact, a museum, for example, needs to have advantage in doing that. But also a company that could say, I go directly to that museum. Why would it go through the competence center and doing its uh, service instead of uh, directly working with that? And that is the kind of question that you need to solve. And I think for the way we have um, made structure that we have all answers for that. Huh? On the other hand, um, the way we see income uh, is mainly from the projects. Uh, we envision uh, a membership fee which is something like 300 euro and not more. And that means, in fact, it's not for free. And you're not there for uh, being a nice guy, but you, you're there because you want to be there. That's a 300 euros. It's not the end of the world, but you have to pay it. Huh? And um, uh, But I see 80% of the income coming uh, from projects, from fee on, on, on projects. Um, keeping your network alive is very important. I think that is uh, really the reason also why we want to have customers, people that we work for, that we have done projects for, museums that are interested. In our case, for example, the International uh, Committee on Museums, ICOM, right? to be partner of that, to be really in, involved in it. And so in this way, true, ICOM also reach uh, a large uh, uh, group of museums. And um, doing projects, in fact, I think it is important to understand that we are in a position to do projects. And that is not, I think, not uh, trivial. Half of our members in the consortium at this moment are research centers. And that means, in fact, they have a daily practice of doing projects. They are used to do these kind of things, right? Uh, they have contracts, they have business partners, they have, uh, they are dealing with deadlines and, 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 and deliverables every day, on one hand. On the other hand, we have several partners in the group do this practice that we deliver, that we present here already. Huh? For example, CNR, which is the coordinator of our uh, VMAS network, is doing this model, is using this model every day already, but on an Italian scale, not on a European scale. So they do projects, for example, for a city, and they do a certain uh, cultural heritage project, and they look for the right persons they need. They have a large pool of people, for example, who have done an internship, internship in, in the organization, and so on. And so in this way, they already use this model, and it is very successful in Italy. And that's also why we are quite confident that we can implement this on a larger scale. Of course, Rome is not built in a day. It will take at least five years to set this up on a European scale. But nevertheless, I think this is feasible. And we have the good examples, and we have to do it just step by step in a natural way. So I hope this helps in research results. Um, no, all of the job. <laughs> Yes. Clarified to talk of research centers, and I was wondering. Sorry, Eivka, I should have gone through you, of course, uh, through the chair. But <laughs> uh, I, I was just wondering. Uh, you talk of research centers, and they normally do produce something. Well, it can be close to market, but not really there yet. And you speak so easily of that of implementing. I was wondering about that. This is an issue for, I know, for OPF and for it. Yes, that is very correct. Um, the implementation force in our computer center network are the companies, right? So that means they, they deliver most of the work. They deliver, in fact, uh, most of the implementation. As soon as there is a research question involved, you go to your, um, your research partners. Huh? Then you go to a research center that develops a certain thing, that tests a certain thing or so. If you really have a fundamental question, you go to university. So there is a kind of cascading, how you say that, um, research center. What I meant with my remark is that the spirit of doing these kind of things 
is uh, I had a favorable ground, let's say, to disseminate these ideas or to come up with these ideas because research centers are used to do these things, but the implementation force really are companies, not research. Is that answering your question? Okay. Thank you very much. That's all very clear and helpful. Uh, Bram, do you have anything to comment on the three on the three sure. things, the knowledge base, commit partners, funding model? I, I think probably in my talk that those were the things I mentioned as well because they, they, they are the crucial parts. Uh, I, I think that on the, in the first instance, if you if you talk about competence, then I think you have to understand the niche that you're in. So because that's where you're good in. Uh, the, the new and, and if you talk about virtual competence centers, that's actually the biggest part you actually want to take is on the web. And the web is the world of the niche. You know, it's it's where you can have one specific center that's very much focused on collating this specific knowledge about this specific subject and uh, wants to be good in it. And that's also why from the very early days of OPF we established our wiki with the knowledge base and that's actually the part where also from the project contributions uh, all the knowledge and all the things that we want to share and that we want to sustain come together. I think more or less to, 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 to sort of uh, respond to what Dan uh, Danielle was saying about the value of projects I think as a starting point for collaboration, projects are fine, but a little bit depending on what your uh, competence center is supposed to uh, deliver over time, it's not necessarily the right tool. Uh, I, I think, uh, and, and if you see a, a big part of, um, uh, of the, the, let's say, the, the expectations around OPF is that we provide sustainable tools. A sustainable software tool, you can make it as a project but you can't maintain it as a project because some of these tools will be there for 10 years, for 15 years. Uh, David knows exactly that, like for instance, projects like UDFR are knocking on everyone's door, hey, can you help me to sustain this? Because they made a nice prototype, whether you like it or not, or whether the functionality is splendid. Important, but they don't have the money that, that, that OPF is in, is not uh, making a project work. Of course, we like to participate in projects and get the best out of there as well and, and, and uh, kind of use it as a glue for the community and help them to sustain things. But some of the tools that we have, and whether it's, uh, it are tools about imaging quality or whether it's tools about identification, they need to be there in 10 years' time as well. So, and that is why we uh, focus on creating a community that on a kind of voluntary base, without incredible project funding, like an open source community, helps to maintain those tools over the longer term. What well, I think, but that's probably the difference in in, in produced outcome of FEMUST and OPF. Can I quickly react to that? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes. I think it's very much dependent on the nature, indeed, of the sector. Um, what we do within VMAST is using standard and, in most cases, open source tools to deliver what we need to deliver, right? If you do OCR, if you do digital preservation, if you do more specialized things, you need really more specialized tools. Uh, the number of tools we use is very limited. And that's, indeed, I think, the difference. Huh? Uh, I would not say the same is I'm sure about that, right? but the kind of thing, most of the things that we uh, have to deliver to the virtual um, virtualization of uh, museum activities and so on to uh, digitizing museum objects or in cultural heritage, all can be do done by pretty standard and pretty uh, straightforward tools. Mm -hmm. Because you, you are more or less already inside the operation of a museum while lots of the outcome of research projects are not even implemented and deployed in organizations yet. Exactly. And, and that's, 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 a different, uh, that's a different focus. That's, that's correct, that's correct. And so uh, what we are focusing on is, is, is more on uh, bending, let's say, general purpose tools for use in uh, museums and cultural heritage. For example, we're using at this moment uh, landscape simulation which comes from film. 
But for example, what is the difference if you want in cultural heritage to be used, you need the exact plants. You need to have certain forms of, of plants that are not available because they're not looking properly in film, but they are visually there. They're, they're, they're historically there. They're, they, you need to do them. So mm -hmm. we need to try to bend those tools and try to massage them, try to implement in such a way that we can use those standard tools nevertheless in these different domains. That's, that's most of the work what we do, is adapting, not uh, researching or developing. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're running a bit of out of time, but we, we have some five minutes left. Uh, we had scheduled for ten minutes for David, but I know that he's a champion in efficiency. So, uh, perhaps, uh, David, you'd like to uh, kick off or uh, start with some summary notes. They probably are more appropriate when we do the full webinar in October. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? This was just the practice, but the practice was already okay. Been, good. Uh, I've just turned off various uh, things, which should David. Can I hand over for help. The last five um, minutes to you? So, uh, yes, it was extremely interesting, and um, uh, and I think Eve, you've summarised very very nicely. So maybe the most valuable thing I can do is to give you. A slightly different take. So, wh where am I coming from? And in particular, that question that, that I asked. So, I guess the way I look at this, and it's interesting to see how it fits in with things. And uh, one question that I had was where, how V must uh, fits into this. But uh, I think that was just answered uh, a short while ago. So, I guess when I think about this, I think of a parson as just one building block. And it's interesting, so Vima started with Epoch, um, uh, the, um, of course, OPF, those planets, and now, now the scape. Uh, and I'm not quite sure of the history of, uh, of impact, but um, I suspect that that's kind of similar. So the way I think about this is that, uh, and Hilda Lee, please um, uh, forgive me for this, but I think about this from the beginning of uh, the APA, because that began really in 2007, and it had a strategic plan. And everything that's been done in not just the Parson, but several other projects, EU projects, have been driven by that original plan. The plan has been updated, but um, if I could take the liberty of saying the original one, it, it was about infrastructure. That was what one of the things the Alliance was keen on. And it was largely concerned, but not exclusively, with sort of science-type data. So not digitization. Um, I mean, we, we have members as, uh, from, from national libraries, but I think... It's where they recognize that they will have to look after scientific type data, which has very different uh, demands. But from the original strategic plan came the Caspar project. And exactly as Bram has said, um, you know, two things from projects are not um, really uh, maintainable uh, unless it's very carefully planned. Caspar tools and things were never meant to be um, maintained. Uh, instead, the plan always was to uh, go move into infrastructure. So that's the other unit, or one of the other units, which is um, now increasingly interested in digital preservation. So there we have, uh, the APA has a project called SIDIPES, and increasingly that will come into the, um, the website and show tools and services and that will, I hope, be linked to the European grid infrastructure uh, and be maintained through a, uh, a, this is the software side of things, the, that will be maintained through some of the very large uh, organizations like the European Space Agency, but the, the core, the APA will uh, play an important role in the um, 
guaranteeing of that uh, being open. So we also have a number of projects, um, for example the ODE project that several people are here are involved in, and um, uh, which is to do with collecting together information, finding out what the drivers and barriers. Um, before that there was the PARS Insight project, which again many of you are involved in. Um, and then a parson is another building block, which is um, broadening the uh, uh, beyond the membership of the APA. But I think almost half the members of a parson are also APA members. Um, and the idea was to use that to look at digital preservation more broadly and see how that fits in with the with the software side of things, which largely is the side of, uh, side of things, and um, uh, underpinning all of this is something which is kind of separate. It's connected with a parson, and it's the audit and certification. Because if that works out, then one essentially um, uh, knows, or, or one has a good one has a good reputation in terms of knowing what uh, will be certified. Uh, so a parson has uh, been instrumental in setting up this European framework, but um, the uh, the part I'm interested in largely is the um, ISO audit and certification, which has an interest in... OK, I'll be very quick which has an interest in the, um, uh, the commercial side. And just as uh, Danielle said, the commercial aspects are very important, but I think that if, uh, for, for the people like Oracle, if, if they want to sell preservation, proper preservation systems, then um, my plan is to make the case that they need the, the services from SIDIP. So I tend to see the virtual centre of excellence in that context with not just a parson coming in. Um, so that's entirely consistent with uh, what has been... Oh, we've lost Bram. Thanks for joining Bram. Yeah, we'll email you. Uh, but I think it, it does fit in with the, with the stories and the, um, uh, the, the, the work that's been done in terms of, uh, you know, it's a continuing line of thought. There's uh, obviously a... Um, you really need the buy-in from the community, and I, I guess I tend to think of that in terms of the proven, continued membership of the APA, which has been in existence for now five, six years. Or is it more? Um, yeah, coming in sixth year. Um, so that's the sort of context I see things in, but clearly, um, you know, the APA itself isn't isn't the model, but it's the basis of the model. So uh, I tend to see this as not. Um, I think Hilda Lee's you showed APA and this virtual centre of excellence. I'm not sure that there's um, a space for two such organisations. Um, so clearly, I t tend to see it as the um, a parson. So SIDIP and all the others bring in information, bring in services, bring in software. A parson brings in a blueprint and a very broad view of digital preservation, and then all of those come together, mash up into the um, APA, and create the virtual centre of excellence which we can say would have a beginnings back in 2000 and uh, well, basically 2007 and has you know, a con consistent continuing membership which takes some of the stresses and strains out of worrying about budgets, has a proven record in projects and um, but still has a lot of changes, just as Bram said, um, a lot of change is needed um, as we more fully identify, you know, the 
the markets, the challenges, the business plan and so forth. So I think that, I mean, there's, there are, you know, th these are different things we've heard. Um, I mean, in my own mind, I can see how they, they fit together and how the lessons fit together. I mean, it, it does tell me that, um, you know, we planned out, uh, of course, with Hilda Lee's help, so it's not uh, too surprising, you know, a path um, forward to come up with a plan, um, or how to get a plan. So um, I think that there's a, a broad uh, set of um, consistency in all this, and... I guess over the next two years we would expect to learn more from from all of these centres um, yeah, to help improve the plans that we make in a parson. So I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, David. That's uh, helpful as well. And I guess, Hilde Lees, while well, you're finishing and completing your document, uh, we will uh, learn more about the best options for a direction for APA, APARSEN, and everything we do in this project. Um, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, we're that. Yeah. I, I just want to ask David that what he just said about APARSEN, coming from APA and such. I think it would be very nice if you could add that to the report. Simon already added something about, but in the section background for a person, I think it would be good to state what you just said there, because uh, this report is much broader than the a person project, and it will be very interesting to to have that there, because it is again an animal. Of course, later on, to the future, well, but this was just a brief thing I wanted to ask. So, sorry, I could do that. No, that's fine. That's very useful. Okay, then uh, last but not least, I want to uh, announce the date for the proper webinar, uh, which is 16th of October, Tuesday. That seems to be the best date for the doodle poll. And Danielle, I hope you will be joining us again because your talk was really very interesting and uh, showed so much practical uh, matters for it. I'll be sending around an email but just to uh, inspire you to stay tuned on the topic and uh, to see you again on the webinar. And I want to thank everybody for their presence. Uh, Evka, Evka, can I just, uh, can you hear me? I've been anyway. I hope you can hear me. I was, uh, I've tried a different mechanism for recording this. Yeah, um, so I'll <laughs> so I'll take a look and see how it is. It'll need a little bit of editing, um, but I hope I can get it out as a fairly standard. Um, Good morning. Um, yes, right. uh, um, a video. But it is almost two hours long. <laughs> okay. Bye bye.